30 seconds of logos. Horror movie opens up at night outside of a house cliche. Reading. Being brave doesn't mean you're not scared. It means you are scared, but you hang in there. I know he's probably just trying to make David feel better about all this, but what choice does this kid have but to hang in there? This kid's possessed by a demon, not trying gas station sushi. I won't let anything happen to you. Unkeepable promises. When your homage to The Exorcist just makes me want to watch that movie instead. Homage fails! If Ed and Lorraine are there and a priest is on his way, then clearly David's parents believe some crazy sh** is going on with their kid. So why would they leave him alone at any point during this? Are they under the impression that the demon will only f with David if there's an audience present? Getting in the bathtub to protect yourself from a demon. Demon's fingers just so happen to look exactly like the shower ring so that this scene can happen. What's happening, buddy? Are you okay? Could you turn on a light? Okay, let's get him down to the car. We'll drive him to the church. If the plan was always to do this at the church, then why didn't they meet the father at the church? I don't understand. Is the demon inside the kid, or is it chasing the kid and swiping at the walls blindly? Or is the demon inside the kid and peeking out to make these claw marks? A few minutes later, it f***s up a whole kitchen, far away from David's body. So I'm gonna chalk this up as a really cool effect that makes no goddamn sense. You really shouldn't have let us take a look at this book movie. The stuff written here is about electing an abbot and blessing an abbot. It has jack f to do with an exorcism. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Is Lorraine like the exorcist relief pitcher or something? It's 1981, so is she like the Raleigh fingers of exorcists? It's not working! Yeah, but how do you know? Are you supposed to see a gradual improvement when someone gets an exorcism? Does the demon start bleeping f***ing swear words? David survives this. Also, what's amazing about this scene is that the director didn't tell any of the cast that the actor playing David was gonna do this, so their reactions are real. Leave him alone! Arnie, don't talk to him! Why wasn't Arnie already aware he shouldn't do this? Did Ed just skip over the don't talk to the demon portion of the pre-exorcism demonstration? Leave him alone and take me! Either this works or f***ing Arnie. Take your pick. Also, the demon takes over Arnie now, but decides to hold off doing any more damage for almost another month. But why? Is there any reason sh** can't still go down tonight in a different vessel? Every f***ing single one of these movies claims this is the most sinister discovery or most evil demon that the Warrens have ever encountered. We're gonna put a stent into his artery. Ah, if it's 1981, you're not. While stents were patented as early as 1972, they weren't being used on the regular in humans until the late 80s. Ed would be getting major open heart bypass surgery, but that would put him down for the count for the rest of the movie, so so convenient time traveling stent use is convenient. And now that David's out of the woods, maybe we should put all this behind us and get out of this place. Arnie still wants to be involved with Debbie's family after all that demon possession shit went down the previous night. That's called a red flag, Debbie. This is some more demon prankery bullshit. And I'm having a super hard time figuring out how the demoning works in this movie. If they're possessing a body, then why all the extracurricular away from the body bullshit? And the best you can do is push cereal, choosing to touch whatever this is. This occultist shows up to scare Ernie and then leaves like a dick. Did I ever tell you the story of how we met? Skip! The Three Musketeers starring Gene Kelly and Lana Turner was released in 1948. Ed and Lorraine Warren in real life were married in 1945 and would not have just started dating as this flashback shows. Yes, this is a movie and that was real life, but we're still us, so... I went out with my girlfriends and... And he was an usher at the movie theater that we went to. Falling in love with an usher at a movie theater. Afterwards. We went out for ice cream. I know I said skip, and I meant it, but the sin counter told me, you have to come take a look at this, and I complied like an asshole. But this isn't a good How I Met Your Mother story at all. He was an usher, and then we went to get ice cream, leaves out a lot of detail. It's the yada yada of the Conjuring universe. So we'll eventually find out that this woman is a Satanist cursing everyone. Does that mean she's actually there spying on Arnie? Or can she just project herself wherever she wants to go? And why would she even need to do that? He's already been cursed, and or possessed, so what is her f***ing with him accomplishing? The end goal is going to be the same regardless, right? Isn't she just giving people an even better chance of catching her by pulling this minor league poltergeist bullshit. The Satanist who is doing this needs Arnie to complete an extremely vague plan. Something about giving a demon a soul in exchange for money? I have no idea. But whatever the case may be, she could have killed Arnie by turning on this chainsaw unexpectedly and her plan would have been wrecked if that happened. You call. It's fine, it's over. David <laughs> is safe, the demon is gone. How does Lorraine not know what's going on? From the other two movies, and even later in this film, when she helps the detective in Danvers, we see how easily Lorraine picks up on the presence of evil. Even with her concern over Ed, she still should have felt the demon's presence wasn't totally gone after it left David. We wouldn't dare play the music, but anyone who plays their stereo this loudly and is this obnoxious deserves a f***ing sin. My name is Lorraine Warren. I know how this is gonna sound, 
but there's going to be a tragedy at the Brookfield boarding kennels. Why doesn't she just lie and say, I'm hearing screaming coming from the kennels and I'm worried about it, rather than trying to convince someone over the phone that she has psychic powers. Is she worried about lying? Is God going to prevent her from going to heaven if she lies about this? Also, the rain is insanely perfect timing on the matter. Did the Satanists purposely wait for Ed to wake up before igniting Arnie? It's hilarious to me that this demon is making Arnie see things that aren't there so that he'll be adequately motivated to murder the kennel manager here in a minute. It didn't seem like David had much of a problem going right after his dad for no reason earlier. Arnie looks like a ghoul, and it will be revealed shortly that he has blood everywhere on him. But this cop drives past him, then makes a U-turn, as if he didn't see all that blood until the movie tells the audience that it's there. If these religious objects would have been enough to provoke an inhuman spirit, if there was one present. The fact that he can read from the Bible just seals it. So why did you let this guy read for so long if all these things would have provoked the inhuman spirit as quickly as you expected? I feel like a time-traveling subplot must have been left on the cutting room floor, because that is the only explanation for how this 2004 copy of Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norell wound up in a film that takes place in 1981. The court accepts the existence of God every time a witness swears to tell the truth. I think it's about time they accept the existence of the devil. But there is nothing stating the court doesn't accept the existence of the devil. They might just not accept that the devil made a kid commit a brutal murder. The two things are not mutually exclusive. Introduce you to Annabelle. All right. Show me what you got. I'm sure this played well in theaters when everyone saw this poor lawyer's face. Ha <laughs> ha! They introduced her to Annabelle. Holy sh! But are you really trying to tell me that they were able to wake up Annabelle to do some creepy sh while she was there? Did they let her out? Did the lawyer sleep over while Annabelle did her thing? Were the Warrens pointing and laughing at her while they unleashed the most evil thing in their Christian home? Wow, it took 30 minutes, but family moving into a new house before the horror starts cliche is in full effect. You know you're supposed to do this when you get married. And you're definitely not supposed to do this when it's your girlfriend's parents' house. What's next, Arnie? You want to ask Mr. and Mrs. Glatzel if they want you and Debbie to christen the bedroom for them? Arnie didn't need a demon inside him to get creepy. He was doing just fine on his own. This waterbed's on for some time. Not only that, this is being told through a recording the Warrens made, which means David probably said, I jumped up and down on the waterbed and an arm grabbed me. And then he moved on to the next part of the story. It took him 10 seconds to do what this movie does in three minutes. How scary could this demon possibly be if it can't keep a grip on a kid's wrist? Hun, will you let me handle this? You're gonna ruin your dress if you go in there. What the f*** was that line of dialogue about? This is a woman who has fought off all the demons and ghosts. And Ed is concerned she might get in a tiff because a little dirt gets on her clothing? Get the f*** out of here with this nonsense. So, um, the guest room's about... 15 feet in and to the right. Because you better believe in the five months I was here and my brother was possessed by a demon, I spent a lot of time in this cellar and always carried around a tape measure. Why are rats attracted to the evil witch totem lying beneath this house? Do they think it's food? Are rats inherently evil? This is like 2001 where we'll see the rats learn how to use bones as weapons and before you know it, we're launching space shuttles to Jupiter. Lorraine takes three pictures from the exact same angle and pretends like that's a comprehensive way to document it. We've heard of satanic rituals like this. A demon is summoned, the possessed individual takes a life, and the demon departs. No, you haven't. You spent this whole movie dumbfounded that you didn't know what the f*** was going on. Wouldn't this have been one of the first things to pop in your head if it was so common? There might be someone else we can ask about this. And he might end up being directly involved with the witch's backstory because convenience. The why is irrelevant. But I mean, it really shouldn't be. This movie sets up a central mystery that ends up having no answer of consequence. It's just witches and chaos and sh**, which is fine. But why set up a mystery at all if you're not going to give us an answer? I don't want to go down there. Woman who supposedly has taken on hundreds of demons and has a goddamn museum of evil sh** stored in her house doesn't want to go down there because I guess this is a new level of evil? I collected these when I was studying the disciples. Ram. Kastner has his own Ed and Lorraine Warren artifact room. Were these just common additions to houses throughout the 70s? You should burn all this. Says the woman who has the exact same closet full of Satan that this guy does. A few days after the disciples were all found guilty, his baby was born six weeks early. But it's hot outside of its body. But nothing happened to the jurors, and not the judge either, or any of the detectives. They just targeted the prosecutor's baby and his wife. Makes sense. <laughs> 45 minutes in and we're still at demons moving mop buckets. We should at least be up to chair stacking by this point. Why is the demon continuing to demon? Aren't they supposed to leave and never come back? Especially since Ed Warren was so sure about how this worked. If the purpose of the possession is to kill someone, that task has been accomplished and there should be no more demons messing with Arnie at this point. Color me your color, darling. I know who you are. 
Man, this is a f***ing detailed curse. The demon even remembers the song that was unintentionally playing when it decided to have Arnie get all knife happy. I'm sure Blondie is very proud. I'm really beginning to think that the demon rules are being twisted so that the movie can have more jump scares and sh**. And this f***er just grabs a hold of discount Lucas Hedges and leaves. F***ing hell, demons, what's the point? Do we really need a shot of the mailbox to establish where we are? A shot of Ed and Lorraine in their house would work just as well. But glad the mailbox painter got to show off his expertise that day. Hey guys. Ed, let me. Oh, don't be silly, Lorraine. You might brush your robe up against this pile of books. One of these is a knife used on Katie Lincoln. The others I just pulled from the evidence locker. You have a 33% chance of randomly picking the right one, but I figured I'd base the entire test on this game. And despite the fact that I acknowledged this later, f*** it. CinemaSins is gonna send this shit anyway. We did. If you knew anything about this case, you'd be able to pick the correct knife based on the date written on the tags of each of these bags. The one Lorraine pushes forward comes from 1981. The one on the far right has the year of 1979. And while I can't be 100% certain about this middle knife, it looks like the year ends in zero and definitely not one. Between this and Army of the Dead, we are two films into 2021's suspicious mind plays while characters are driving a car cliche. Granted, there's no oral sex being performed this time around, but they can't all be winners. You missed a turn. Funny how Lorraine's psychic powers are on full blast now when they haven't been for the entire movie. Feels like this superpower could have been handy earlier in the movie, but oh well. David is totally interested in watching Arnie and Debbie's hands in this shot and totally not interested in the next shot. Ed, something terrible happened here. No sh lady. This is a previous crime scene, and we were all aware of this. Lorraine Warren is as useful to crime scenes as Dan Smithson was in Species. F***ing Dan Smithson. So this happens, and it leads to Lorraine's vision of the two girls running around the tree and laughing. A delightful jump scare, to be true. But what the f*** were they doing where a hand had to reach around the other side of the tree? If they were kissing, it's fine, you can tell me, but usually you grab your partner's head, not a fistful of bark. At least not in 1981. I got you something. They were selling them at the May Festival this year. Katie and Jessica were screwed regardless. Either one of them gets possessed and one of them gets murdered or one of them becomes the may queen i've seen midsummer and i kind of feel like door number one would be the better outcome definitely less bear suit f***ing if you take that door if jessica was cursed she certainly seemed happy back then we've seen how the demons have affected david and arnie and they didn't look like they were ready to frolic in the woods and handing out bracelets vera farmiga's audition tape for bates motel somehow made its way into this movie if lorraine is so into character when she's doing some deep psychic stuff why was she able to keep herself from jumping into the river just like jessica did hell it's so dark out here it's a miracle she stopped herself the f*** is this demon even doing here? We find out later that Lorraine needs to touch the dead girl to even get a connection with the Satanist, and the Satanist hasn't sent them the cursed flowers yet, so this is some unbelievable bullshit, even for a movie with demons in it. Ed, who's got a bad leg and has to catch Lorraine in midair while a demon drags her off the rock, still has enough power to make that happen. You know, we dragged this basin twice. Thank God they didn't find her body earlier, huh? Or else Lorraine and Ed wouldn't have had anything to trade. And they wouldn't have gotten this case file to help them with Arnie's very legal and very cool not guilty by reason of possession plea. Arnie needs to be put on a 24-hour suicide watch. He's got... <laughs> How can this demon manipulate a phone call between Debbie and Ed when it hasn't even connected with these two yet? Ed doesn't get cursed until he goes back home. If this demon could interrupt phone calls, why didn't it do so when the Glatzels called the Warrens and a priest to help them out with their son? God gives everyone the right to defend themselves. Contraband. Believe it not. Didn't you have a good rapport with a detective who knows Lorraine has psychic powers? Why couldn't you give him a call before breaking into the morgue? Also, breaking into the morgue basically shows how worthless that case file was. What were they expecting to find in it that would have been good for Arnie's case? Even if there were multiple stories about Jessica looking possessed, it wouldn't have helped. Basically, the Warrens got a huge lucky break, that the body hadn't been found, and that Lorraine convinced them to drag the river again. The lights in here work on a timer, so of course Ed turns it to about 15 minutes, so that some scary f can happen when the time runs out. Yet again, the sound of a train is going to help the good guys find the bad guys. You know, bad guys need to set up their headquarters in places nowhere near a train so that they can get away with more sh**. Those black candles, it's 12 of them. See, even Lorraine Warren gets disgusted by overcandling. She's reaching out to Artie. You mean, at the exact time you used your powers to find the Satanist hideout? That's some crazy ass luck. She could have done this way earlier, but she kindly waited until you could do something to stop it. And this Black Sabbath. That sounds neat and all, but is the Satanist performing what you would call a Black Sabbath? What the f*** does that even mean, aside from a Baba movie and some classic rock and roll? By the blood of Calvary, I command that! Somehow this immediately works, even though we've seen the Warrens yell all sorts of things in the past and it didn't do jack s***. And the connection. 
Deception works both ways. How does Lorraine not already know this is possible? They've dealt with all sorts of supernatural beings. Surely this isn't the first time someone being able to communicate with them has come up. The Satanist now counterpunches by manipulating a different corpse inside the morgue, using the two-way psychic connection that Lorraine mentioned. But if the connection is through Jessica, then how is she controlling an entirely different dead body? Thought she could only control the one she marked or cursed. We got the case file. There's gotta be something here that connects these girls back to him. I got something to show you too. <laughs> this case file is worthless. They keep bringing it up, but then get distracted immediately because the case file is worthless dog shit. It's about as useful as a dick on a rainbow. I think that's how the saying goes. But this part looks like Aramaic. The key to stopping Satan is written in several different languages so that Ed can't translate the important part. Because of course it is. Whenever I discover a cure for cancer, I'm going to type important sentences by letting my cat randomly walk back and forth on my keyboard so the doctors will have to guess what I mean by five... <laughs> Once started, the curse must be completed. Her soul depends on it. Why didn't she just complete the curse sooner? And why wasn't it complete before? Didn't she get a murder out of it? Why was her work not finished after that? Unclean spirit! Ah! Wait, why did that work? Ed's clearly cursed now, and nobody's been able to snap people out of it once they become murderous. But apparently all you have to do is shout someone's name and grab their arm, and it's all good. Too bad Debbie didn't do the same with Arnie when he killed the kennel guy. Ed, what the hell is going on? Help me find it! Great time to play the pronoun game when you need someone to help find the satanic totem. I just arrived yesterday while you guys were driving home. Then why didn't it curse Drew instead of Ed? And why did it curse Ed specifically? Has he even been in this office since he got back? If you're telling me that David got cursed because he was jumping on a waterbed directly above the totem, then Drew should have been cursed as soon as he accepted this vase full of flowers, right? How did she get that large of an item in a vase with that small of an entryway? She would have had to build the vase around it. The Satanist power is strongest at night. And humans only use 10% of their brain. This woman lives in the area. Finally, Ed and Drew find something in the case file that's worth a damn. They find out that Jessica received her totem at college, which is close to the other totem places. They can now triangulate where the Satanist is working because she's lazy and did everything local. But here's the thing. The whole reason they wanted the case file is because they think it'll help Arnie in court later. How does finding a Satanist's home prove that she sent totems and the totems do exactly what the Warrens claim? Then it can't be either of these two. The commuter lines don't run that late. So, Larry, how are we going to get the warns to where they can find this mysterious cursing lady? Well, Hank, I was thinking we just create all this trained knowledge for Drew to have. Brilliant, Larry. That's why they pay you the big bucks. This is hard. The Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It, follows the tried and true law and order method of if you've seen this asshole before and other things, then he's 100% the killer or closely involved. It's the curse. I do my best translating by fireplace light. I don't believe in electricity. The curse needs three victims to be complete. The child the lover, and the man of God. This translation throws a Godzilla-sized monkey wrench into the whole movie, because who's supposed to be the child? Well, the child was supposed to be David, right? But once Arnie told the demon to take him instead, then there was no demon inside a child anymore. No big whoop, I suppose, because Arnie could be the lover. And that works too, but then we have to decide what Jessica is in this scenario. She's not a child. Could be the lover, but now you have two lovers and no child, and your very specific curse can't work anymore. Lorraine had trepidations of walking down here earlier. Now that it's good and dark, and the comment was made about how Satanists work better at night, she's like, f*** it. The church couldn't no, so I raised her here, in secret. That must have been awkward when you went to your parish and had to leave your baby for hours. Or doing all that specialty work out in the field, investigating Satanists and sh**. It's just the firing. Seriously? You know there are f***ing actual curses taking place and people being possessed and murdered all over the goddamn place, but you're gonna throw that belief out the window and the lights flicker? It could just be the wiring, but why take your f***ing chance, Father? This is your goddamn job! And now I know the real reason she's here. There are tunnels under this land. I always go back to this truth. Satanists be shopping. I mean tunneling. Also, this still doesn't explain why Kastner's daughter is specifically targeting these people. I guess she could be going after the Warrens to get them out of the way, but what about Jessica and the Glatzels? And yeah, yeah, we already seen the bullshit about why being irrelevant, but Ed and Drew found a fucking link to all the victims living in the same area. She's here. Weird, since Arnie just told Debbie and the priest that she was close back at the hospital. She can't be fucking everywhere, movie. But maybe he means the demon? The problem with this movie is you never know if it's the Satanist or if it's the demon the Satanist is trying to call. It's all kinds of horse I failed as a father. Please, God, don't let me fail. I know she deals in devil worship and all that, but she's human. How does she have the ability to Hayden Christensen over here? Sure, this Satan-worshipping asshat can perform jumper tricks when it comes to killing her dad, but when it comes to attacking Lorraine, she turns to walking slowly as her strategy. Open your eyes and look at me. Why can't Lorraine yell out something about, and this slutty eye of an eagle, or by the beard of Damascles, my vagina is strong, and get out of this pretty easily? Something, something, the Lord must not be mindful of our sins or some shit. 
It loses something in the Google, I'm sure. But how is this supposed to work on curses? If there's a common book any priest can get his hands on to Latin away curses, I'll once again ask why Ed and Lorraine didn't diagnose it sooner. Evil Ed to Ed by Dawn. If you didn't know this was Ed and Lorraine, you could sneak the scene into Titanic and you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Now open your eyes. So that power of love nonsense worked after all. This movie is like Interstellar and Back to the Future with none of the time travel. As this satanic asshole walks towards Ed and Lorraine, I'm wondering why wasn't she at the altar before Ed smashed it? She's done all her bullshit from there. But when Ed comes in with a huge sledgehammer, she's conspicuously absent. Don't fucking tell me she was busy possessing Arnie because this movie has been very inconsistent about how any of this works. The Conjuring universe has come up with some pretty scary and classic adversaries. Annabelle, the nun, the crooked man. The occultist, who looks about as scary as a pissed off school teacher, will not be one of the most memorable. Your curse is broken. Ah! It was good of the curse to wait until Ed said that instead of, you know, when he smashed the altar. You promised the demon a soul. Is that what this was about? I didn't hear anything about the ultimate motive for all this until now, and from what I've seen, this is too complicated for even the most dedicated person to pull off. You bit off more than you can chew, Satanist. I forgot my pills. If Lorraine was this concerned, why wasn't she more prepared? She could fit a lot more pills into that f***ing locket. Now that the Warrens are out of the demonic masturbation lair, what story do they tell the cops about Kastner and his daughter? It's not like everyone believes in Satan now just because they won the movie. As we see Ed walk around the Annabelle Hall of Mayhem, I wonder what happened to Claster's room full of insidious objects. Did the city sell them off at auction? Do you know how many spin-offs that's gonna cost us? Yeah, we really should see how the detective of Jessica's case feels about her death right now. Jessica didn't have the budget for grieving parents. Furthermore, I guess this means the whole town is sold on demonic possession because they're honoring someone who brutally murdered her bestie. So the jury hedged their bets. This is almost like the exorcism of Emily Rose verdict. It's like, yeah, I don't really believe Satan made you do this, but just in case he did, here's only five years for stabbing someone 22 times. Sentimental gazebo purchases. In the name of Jesus, Jesus repels you. Movie thinks playing the actual recording of David's exorcism will convince me. It won't. Plus, you had a video camera too, there, right? 